first in a series of talks that we're, that we're hosting in, in association with Gaganel, um, who are also here presenting some of their latest products and innovations in an installation called Statement of Form. Um, our first talk today, uh, the topic's going to be sustainability and longevity in design. Uh, I'm joined by three panelists um, who are all sitting here with me. We have uh, designer Soren Rose, uh, founder of Soren Rose Studio. We have Francesca Portazine, who is director of interiors at BIG. And we have Mike Holland, who is head of industrial design at Foster and Partners. Um, and before we sort of begin, each speaker is going to kind of give a little bit of a presentation on this topic. But, be but before we do so, I'm going to let them each introduce themselves uh, in a little bit in a little bit more detail than I have. Why don't, why don't you begin, Soren? All right. And do we run the slides now? I think just introduce yourself for oh. now. <laughs> Hi everybody, uh, my name is Soren Rose. I uh, run a small studio in Copenhagen where we work with multidisciplinary uh, sustainable design. Uh, we do furniture, we do interiors, and we do industrial design. Mm -hmm. Hello, I'm Francesca Portesini. I'm the director of interior for the Arkingers Group in New York. And uh, I'm overviewing all of the majority of the interior product, uh, project, project in, in the office. Good morning everyone, my name is Mike. Holland. I head the industrial design studio at Foster and Partners. Um, and essentially we work in two ways. We both support the architectural practice, designing elements for buildings, and then we also have uh, a client base uh, of our own. Fantastic. Um, and so why don't you get, get things started with your presentation? Tell us a little bit more about you and, and how sustainability and longevity kind of feed into your practice. Exactly. Thank you. And um, so uh, we actually work uh, with, um, started out as a, a purely uh, furniture and um, lightning uh, design studio. And um, so basically for 12 years, we work with, um, with uh, various uh, companies. It could be uh, Cane Line, um, we work with Muto, Gandhi Blasco. Um, and it's always been, sustainability always been um, a topic. I think it is for all of us in any design process, um, how to obtain a, a product that is uh, both commercial and, and both sustainably built. Um, and it's something that uh, we work with for, for many years. We're sort of like uh, being both in, in Copenhagen and New York, where we also work a lot. We, we sort of like took the best of uh, the Scandinavian tradition. Also think that we have a um, that we have a, a style in, in our work that is uh, that that sort of like reaches out of the Scandinavian design tradition. Um, and we do a lot of lighting design as well. After a few years, we started doing a lot of interior uh, projects as well. I think we um, have one overall goal, which we call legacy. That is to uh, use materials that will um, outlive ourselves. Uh, hopefully, come up with solutions that will uh, people will will keep and not uh, remodel or uh, do construction again. Um, this is a beautiful project we did in New York. We actually um, researched where Mia van der Rohe got his uh, green Verde Alpi marble from the pavilion in Barcelona. And we had uh, literally had them reopen the quarry and develop uh, the marble for it. And it turned out very, very beautifully. Um, and at least that way we're contributing uh, to something that will last for many years. Um, we uh, work a lot with... Um, uh, Gagan as well. Um, 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 thank you for having us here. Um, and uh, and Dinesen and Quadrat and a lot of other high-end um, uh, brands that supply materials for all our projects. Um, and then and then the last thing that has been sort of like huge between um, it's sort of like force between product design and, and interior design has been this uh, collaboration that my studio has with uh, with Björk Engels Group. It's called Klein, which means small in German, and um, it's it's sort of like from a philosophy that um, that I live in a smaller house than my parents does, and I'm pretty sure my kids they're gonna live in a smaller house than I do. And um, we're, we're kind of like just fascinated that our studios 
on, on smaller living. And this is the first result. This is uh, called um, A45. It's uh, positioned here at the Utsun uh, Foundation in Denmark. In Denmark. Um, and, it's, and it's something that we are spending a lot of time trying to figure out um, how can we su supply tiny houses by the world's best architects uh, all around the world. Then the last uh, thing that we have come up with, I went into black, did I do something? Um, we, lost, we lost the signal, we lost the signal. Um, the last thing that we started working on about five years ago was uh, sort of like just a feeling that, you know, um, maybe, the, maybe the world doesn't need uh, another chair or another lamp. So uh, in order for us to only work with the, with the, with the brands that, that uh, really had the, the, the right uh, mindset and the right sustainable angle on manufacturing our furniture and lighting, we actually started, and it won't work, but we started working with a company called LifeStraw. Um, you've probably heard about this straw, same size of this microphone, where you can filter um, several hundred liters of water, purified uh, and purify the water from any polluted source. Um, and for five years, we basically have been the creative agency uh, designing all their products. And for me, I think it gives us a little bit more purpose at the studio. It's been um, it's been very meaningful uh, helping uh, just a last year. We supplied more than 2.5 million people around the globe with um, with the ability to filter water. And this is actually not just that we reached 2.5 million, it's actually that we gave 2.5 million people clean water for a full year of 21 uh, in average. Um, I would love to show the product, but we have a bit of a technical issue. Um, they're they're all nice, I think, uh, and it's, it's really fun to work with. But I with. think it's interesting um, to kind of go from that transition from, I suppose, the kind of traditional role of the designer is, you know, to take getting a brief, designing a product, designing a material, you know, whatever it is, to sort of the more entrepreneurial approach where almost you're designing the brief, you know, you're, the role of the designer becomes actually defining what are the products that we need, not just having someone else tell you and you design them. Is that sort of something you feel you're seeing a lot more of? I think so. I think that was that was basically also why LifeStraw came to us because they saw our aesthetics and they saw um, all the design that we were doing. They were sort of like, can you also do that? We know you don't do product design, but why don't we give it a try? And then, um, uh, you know, a few years down the road, we, we designed, redesigned three of their products. Um, so, uh, yes, I definitely see that, yeah. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get this picture working, so maybe we can move on to the next presentation and maybe we'll get a snippet of it later on. But um, Francesca, maybe you can uh, you can begin. I think we're we able to uh, to have the next presentation load. <laughs> oh, something. Here. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Before we do so, maybe Francesca, you can tell us a little bit about your your <laughs> big and some of the projects you work on sure. before we uh, before we actually get to see some of them. Yes. So as I mentioned, I am the director of interior in Bjarke Ingress Group. But what we do, it is really in a different scales. So we do master plan, and but also we design products. So um, what I wanted to present today, it is uh, a range of uh, uh, projects that, that we do in which the sustainability, it is uh, embraced in different ways. Uh, sometimes it is uh, more a classical approach, like we are following a list of products that we need to, to use in project, as we will see in Google, in which also we studied uh, all the way to uh, use uh, uh, the natural resources from um, the earth and the sun to produce energy. Echo. Talking about Google <laughs> and big, but maybe, yeah, maybe, sorry, you want to finish with the, the I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I think, sorry, yeah. I think we should, oh, we see it later. <laughs> Well, we have some images of the live store for everyone to and get we to want enjoy to now. We want to see it now, <laughs> right? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, God. Okay. So, 
But Jessica, why, why don't you carry on telling us a little bit about Google? I think some of the audience might have been able to see on the screen down here a moment ago, but... Um, yeah, so um, as I was mentioning for Google, we uh, covered the entire roof with solar panel, and the brief is that in 2030 that building is going to be carbon free. Um, then uh, we, for us, uh, uh, sustainability it is also uh, related to the reuse of building, of giving new life to old buildings, as hopefully we will see later in projects that are like the Galerie Lafayette in Paris and also the Noma restaurant in Copenhagen, where we use the uh, uh, existing building that were landmark and we enhance them with a new interpretation, uh, discovering also elements in the building that has been like hidden, as we will see in the Galerie Lafayette. Um, I want to say that sustainability has always been uh, I would say in the DNA, DNA of uh, Bjarkinger's group since the very beginning, we could, we will see hopefully <laughs> the, the um, um, harbor bath in uh, in Copenhagen, in which we brought the city into the into the harbor and vice versa, um, and this signifies that uh, what is. Uh, and good for the for us is the same for the environment and vice versa. If <laughs> if the the fish can live there, we are happy and we can enjoy that. So this is related to how our vision of sustainability in a more enjoyable way, uh, what Bjarke calls hedonistic sustainability. So, um, so we can actually do fun things, fun stuff, and make the world better, much better. Can I ask as well, I mean, obviously sort of your role is more interiors focused and obviously interiors is an area where it's often the hardest to be sort of sustainable, particularly in kind of commercial buildings where fit out means that, you know, things are often changing over quickly. How do you, maybe you can tell me a little bit about your experience of that and kind of changing that mindset and, you know, kind of embedding sustainability in an area that maybe is a little bit more challenging. Yeah, that's definitely very challenging because when we do commercial, the clients say, okay, this is, has to be like uh, five years or like may, maybe maximum 10 years, but they really, uh, they really are not uh, in, in line with the, um, what is the, the trend now. So it, our, our goal is really to educate them in uh, um, explain how uh, an object that is uh, uh, that uh, functions well can can live uh, longer if it also is adaptable for different uses. So uh, we always think in uh, in furniture or product that it can be um, changeable or adaptable through the times uh, and not. Uh, um, and not change and uh, um, and how to say it, um, um, replaced exactly. So I mean, uh, we always think the space in a much longer um, with a much longer life uh, with objects that are uh, changing the, themselves. Mega furniture that uh, can have multiple use, uh, like in Galerie Lafayette, uh, objects that are not only lighting but are stairs or. Uh, different scale mm -hmm. and what about materials do you have quite a strict approach to the materials that you use i mean we have our materials that we use like uh, by dna i would say as also sorry because danish company uh, we like natural wood uh, we now like uh, um, um, bright um, bright materials that can reflect the light bring the natural light inside so we have our palette that we are a little bit more and more refining in a definitely in a sustainable way trying to follow what are the, the, the of course the new regulation and also sometimes clients they have their own list that we need to follow as in Google that has been quite strict so we are adjusting ourselves on on the sustainable way. Yeah. <laughs> do you have any sort of, uh, I guess, like no goes, you know, when it's sort of trying to be sustainable, do you have particular material choices or kind of approaches that you sort of say, no, we don't do that because that's not sustainable? Or do you try to kind of keep an open mind? And um, I think that uh, I, like, if we talk about major uh, sustainability um, um, way of also, ah. you, uh, feel free ah. to flick through some images now. We ah, have okay. your presentation. No, it is. <laughs> Uh, but I will say that the one thing that you, yeah, I'm going, but the one thing with the, I, I would like, uh, we are considering it is the source of the material, where are these coming material, that where the material has been produced, and if it is in a sustainable way. So it is a, a very large, uh, um, 
um, discussion, I would say, uh, sustainability, but it is uh, about uh, like uh, um, or the human side of the production of materials. So I think that we would start from that, inquiring where and what has been the process mm -hmm. to be sure that uh, uh, it is also sustainable for human people. Mm -hmm. So now it is. If I do this, I, I go back. You're going the wrong so way. Is the the green? No? Mm -hmm. mm. Maybe. Maybe not. It was the green, no? It was the, the beginning. Oh, B. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so, I don't know. so yeah, so this uh, project has been finished uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, like uh, I think you all saw, uh, saw this in uh, all the magazine and publications. So these are the so-called dragon scale uh, uh, solar panel. Uh, they're covering the building, as I mentioned, in 2030 will be carbon free production. Uh, so uh, completely sustainable. And we are also working on the land in the surrounding to create uh, environment that the could um, have uh, uh, the, um, the rainwater collected uh, for uh, uh, the cooling of the system and also uh, like uh, we created uh, the, the, the lakes all around. But that's not only. So this is a, a little diagram to explain how is really functioning everything. So we study <laughs> into details. We have a sustainability department actually in our, in our office since I think four or five years. And we are developing our CSI and uh, life cycle analysis because we want as usual, we want to revisit <laughs> everything in our own way, in a, in a big uh, understanding way, like in our logic approach to uh, things. Okay, it's moving. And yeah, from the big scale, we go to the small one here. It is to explain how uh, we wanted to enhance, of course, the natural light inside the building that has to be uh, like the, the proper amount. So these openings are created in relation to that. And how the upper level, this is the upper level where all the employees are staying, are in the maximum uh, ratio with nature and with the light uh, to limit the use of the artificial light while the, all the functions are going to be in the lower level. So this is a kind of a village that we create below this tent and uh, it's really a, a mix of, uh, of everything I would say. Like it's a community, it's a neighborhood uh, inside, the, inside the, the, the Google community. So maybe I need to go quicker now. So this is another project in Shenzhen, is the Shenzhen Energy State Quarter. I wanted to talk about this in, uh, in the sense that we work on the facade to reduce the amount of energy consumption and we managed to do it 30% in the entire building, being able to uh, orient the, the facade, the panels, in a way that are blocking the solar emissions, uh, but that they are allow allowing maximum visibility. visibility. Uh, going down to the scale, these are the thermal baths in, uh, in Copenhagen, in which uh, following a programmatic uh, um, brief we had, uh, this is like uh, 2007, it was done in 2007, two years after that the RK founded uh, his, uh, his company, so it's one of the very first ones. And uh, it is very simple, we follow programmatic requirement and we create this uh, system of pools uh, that was able because the, the, the water was clean finally in the arbor and could be enjoyable, enjoyed by people. So it's really like uh, uh, what is good for the fish is good for the human, as Bianca says. <laughs> and this is the Galerie Lafayette uh, in, uh, in Champs-Élysées. This uh, opened in 2019, an old building uh, from 1930, Art Deco. Uh, once we entered inside, uh, we uh, discover amazing glasses that uh, here are not be visible. The original one, there was a dome uh, that was covered. There was a virgin store before. And we turned like, uh, the additional elements done after 1930, we, we turned them down and we discovered the beauty of the building. We were fascinated by the glasses and we enhanced them in uh, these additional volumes that we created for the different brand to expose their, uh, their goods. But also, these are also for performance or for installation. Um, this revisit of the building is also um, following the idea of the, the, the retail, what is going to be the retail in the future. What I want to, want to um, 
highlight here is this that dotted line. That uh, this is uh, an artist by Superflux Studio, Danish uh, artist that Bjarke wanted to have in the building because that line is uh, the line of the water in 100 years. So just like to symbolize that in 100 years, if <laughs> we don't do something, <laughs> it's going to be. Uh, dramatic the situation <laughs> so it's really like uh, uh, I think that for us designers it's very important to uh, have this sensitivity and uh, to explain this to the majority of the people uh, we need to do something and we need to be careful Noma the long building it was uh, um, a storage a mine storage for the uh, Royal uh, um, Danish Navy and it was a landmark. Um, here is the new location of the Noma, and we uh, we work with uh, uh, this explosed um, concept of uh, um, um, kitchen, I would say, uh, and we built it around the pre-existent building, leaving it and enhancing with a new function. So the idea of sustainability is really taking what it is there and enhancing with a new design vision. Uh, so this is the interior, and then this is uh, Bjarke's house. <laughs> so as he's doing, he found this shipwreck he loved. This was like uh, uh, breaking ice between island, and then he made it his own apartment. And down to the design of the product that uh, uh, we are doing, and this is the lighting that we are doing with uh, Artemide, uh, we did already, and uh, the, this was born to bring life inside of the building. This is a light uh, that makes uh, plants growing, and it was for a project in Dubai office in which we wanted to have uh, this natural element inside where it was not possible. And Wonderful, thank you so you. much. <laughs> and Mike, why don't you... Uh, Fingers crossed our technology keeps going. But the beauty of coming last. Um, <laughs> yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike uh, Hollands. I head the interior design studio. Um, and I guess projects sort of for us happen in, in two ways, sort of explain sometimes their, their direct approaches. Other times it's more an entrepreneurial sort of development. And we've got a series of projects that show that sort of come about in different ways. <coughs> So I think one, a very good example of a product where we've developed it internally is the lever chair that we developed for um, Matteazzi, the uh, Italian chair manufacturer. And really from the outset, we were looking to um, develop a, a comfortable, low carbon chair designed to last and get, essentially get better with age. Um, the starting point was our sort of uh, adjustable ergonomic rig and we invited hundreds of people to, to sit on this rig and we tuned it, we adjusted it, the curves, the inclination of the arm. Um, and essentially we were trying to create the most comfort for the broadest range uh, of people. Oh, sorry. Um, and we then took those various planes uh, and angles and surfaces and, and connected them in the most sort of efficient way. And, and that was the um, approach to the design of the chair as a whole. We took that all the way through to the end. We then, in, in a relatively sort of finished state, we then approached Matiazzi with the chair. We knew from visiting them that they, they really epitomize sustainable manufacturing. Um, and <laughs> this is all gone slightly crazy. But what we also did as part of the design process uh, is we instigated an LCA, a life cycle assessment. So that actually looked at all of the um, energy involved in creating um, the chair. That EPD, um, LCA, was then sort of verified via an EPD, uh, and also we then got a declare label. But what we, what we did throughout the process, and this is a snippet of the film that we created, the making of the chair, is that data really informed the design. So there were details and connections and tool paths that essentially were derived from, from that data, using less material, making it more uh, efficient. But what also came out from that process was that the, the natural upholstery, uh, sorry, the man-made upholstery rather, the foams and the, the, uh, the fabrics actually was a significant part of the carbon uh, of the chair. So on a subsequent collaboration um, with a UK manufacturer called Benchmark, we were designing a range of tables uh, uh, and chairs. And there we, we looked to natural materials, um, coconut husk, latex, lamb's wool, and what was 
what was you know what was really good about it actually is that we were creating just the same level of comfort. It was surpassing the wear and tear uh, and also the fire codes. Um, Benchmark have also then gone on to do the full sort of EPD uh, and LCA for the full, for the range. And I think what going through the process with, with with these two projects and others that we've got in the pipeline, I think it really illustrates where um, where we can um, make um, product more sustainable in in the, in the sourcing of the materials, in the transportation, the energy used to 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 machine them the packaging, the transportation, essentially the full life cycle uh, of, of a product. We have a, um, a sustainability team within um, Fosters and they've been analyzing buildings, Foster buildings, other buildings, and one rather surprising statistic was that 25% um, of the embodied carbon, uh, or up to 25% of embodied carbon building uh, is the interior fit out uh, and the furniture. And so on a, uh, this was a collaboration with Quadrat, uh, the um, uh, Danish fabric company, we designed soft cells with them, which is a, a wall and ceiling product. We wanted longevity and sustainability to be at the heart of uh, the product. And so essentially it's a, a, it's a recycled aluminium frame. Uh, this is a, an image of our main studio, uh, the first installation. Uh, here a relatively simple installation. It's, it's a recycled frame, holds the, the fabric under um, continuous sort of tension, um, allows access to all the services. It can also achieve far more complex sort of installations here in our Cleveland uh, clinic in the US. And here just sort of zooming in some of the details, it has a sort of patented leaf spring um, maintaining the tension. It, and it's really, it's designed to match the lifespan of a building. The fabric can be removed and cleaned and if you know, at the end uh, of its life has to be removed. It's designed for disassembly and to break down uh, into all of its uh, constituent materials. And then on a, a, a final um, project, this was another sort of entrepreneurial one that we developed internally. Um, the issue of building services, not just from infrastructure and energy, but also from um, visual noise. You know, we've all been in buildings and looked up to the ceiling plane and see this peripheral of different devices all working on separate uh, networks, um, all designed by different hands in different materials. And we sought to create um, one unified dimension, one unified language. Um, Devices, so in, in a building there's typically five networks that they all work on. Node brings that into three. And then certain devices will actually perform multiple functions. So a motion sensor will uh, measure motion, uh, light, and also temperature and share that data with the relevant systems. And essentially it, it's designed for sort of more residential plaster-in settings um, within commercial layouts. Has a, a, a number of different sort of interface devices. They're all IP addressable. So what it's also doing is, you know, buildings are all about change and evolving. Open plan space is becoming more um, cellular and vice versa. And, and the whole, uh, this is showing some of the sort of the uh, infrastructure that all the various um, installation engineers can access. But it's all about evolution and the changing nature of um, spaces. Thank you so much. Um, I think what's kind of really emerged out of all three presentations that I really enjoyed was sort of this idea of really embedding sustainability into the design process, not sort of designing something, th something and then working out how to make it sustainable. Do you think, and I don't know if this is a particular que a question to anyone in particular, but maybe, uh, maybe it might be to all of you, which is, is the industry ready? Uh, you know, is, is there a sort of a willingness there to sort of to kind of rethink that process of design so that sustainability can kind of come in from the start? Like, is it, is it something that's easy to achieve or do you think there's something that's gonna be a real challenge for, for us? I'm gonna let you go first, sorry. <laughs> well, I, I mentioned before that I think that a lot of the furniture brands that we were working with as a young studio, they maybe did not have it when we were asking about, it could be packaging or it could be manufacturing. 
they were not willing to sacrifice um, um, the implication of, um, for example, the price point or what, what it might be or their supply chain. And I think that's what made us as a studio, or me personally, move into, for example, the collaboration with Livestraw, uh, that is a carbon neutral company that uh, saves literally millions of plastic bottles every year by uh, giving people products that can be uh, reused. Um, you literally just change the filter and they can be used for years and years and years. And uh, once upon, uh, they don't have a value anymore, they can be recycled. So I think uh, for us as an agency, we rely on manufacturers that can, that has this, um, has this uh, vision and ability to be sustainable because we can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. We can design pretty much anything at our studio, but we need manufacturers that will prioritize being sustainable. Mm. Uh, hello? See? Si? Si. Uh, maybe uh, I will add that uh, on a bigger scale, uh, we have um, our sustainability department that would start uh, with uh, the project itself. Actually, first we would ask them to do a sustainability uh, report of the, uh, of the uh, place to understand how are the solar radiation or uh, whatever we can consider as a brief for the project itself, it will start at the very beginning. So we are really trying to make this uh, uh, the starting process uh, for our project. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess the question also is sort of, is, is the kind of definition of sustainability, it feels like is changing all the time. Um, I think there was one point where if we talked about sustainability, we were thinking specifically about the environment and very specifically about usually energy use. But it seems that that kind of definition is broadening a lot more, people thinking a lot about end, you know, end of life cycle um, and a lot of other factors as well, sort of other forms of sustainability, whether sort of social sustainability or things like that. Is that sort of something that you're finding as well? Um, maybe to you, Francesca. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, in fact, uh, um, mm -hmm. And what, what Bjark uh, also like to say is that, uh, as I mentioned before, also uh, sustainability doesn't need to be something uh, that is uh, uh, some, a sort of rule that we need to follow, but we really need to understand that it is uh, something enjoyable for us, for the planet, and then this is changing. And then, and then this is also uh, um, means that uh, if we see uh, in the long run a better, um, uh, the result, uh, uh, we are certainly um, willing to embrace uh, uh, solutions that are longer uh, lifespan. Uh, and uh, uh, I think we are all almost again like uh, this, uh, um, uh, like how to say, use a jet, like use and you throw it away um, way of thinking. Now everything it is uh, uh, it is thought to be uh, to have a, a next life uh, in a different way, and uh, this is embraced. Everything is not only like the product we are using, but I think it's it's part of our mentality. And I also think that after the pandemic, I've been seeing how <laughs> uh, some rivers that become became uh, clean uh, with uh, a more like uh, <laughs> absence of human use or something like that. Uh, we are all more uh, driven uh, totally to uh, this more conscious way of using things until really the very end and then thinking what is the, their life afterward. And I also want to say that the several clients now they are asking us like the recyclable, uh, recycled uh, materials, like uh, plastic or everything that uh, to be part as, uh, uh, of the buildings. And um, Mike, you were talking a little bit about EPDs, um, obviously kind of regulation is something that is sort of coming in in different ways and there's different sort of forms of standards, um, which I guess in a lot of ways helps to avoid greenwashing, or it helps you to sort of be able to compare products. Do you think, do you, are you sort of largely in favor of that, or do you think there are kind of challenges if we sort of start to regulate sustainability too much? Um, I, think, I think to your point, I think there is a lot of um, greenwash. There's so many different certifications within industrial design. There's something like 250 certifications within architecture. Um, for us, the, the, the life cycle analysis and the declare label was as close as we could get to, to where we want it to be. Um, 
but I think we've got to go. We've got to go a lot further, haven't we? And it's almost if, if you, you know, um, I have sort of food allergies. I pay a lot of attention to the contents of, let's say, a pack of sandwiches. If I buy a pack of sandwiches, I know where it's made. I know where it's come from. I know the ingredients. I know the the energy that I'll consume from 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 getting it. There needs to be somehow a better labelling, better standardisation that everyone can work to. Because I think when you do when you do dive in and you really get into the data of where materials have come from, you know, aluminium from one source might have 12 times the carbon from another source. Recycled aluminium has a fraction of the carbon. You know, when you actually, when you actually explore, and we're helping clients at the moment find, you know, lower carbon alternatives, um, it's all there. It just somehow needs bringing it together. Mm. I guess that's also, like, quite a big challenge. Like, th th there's no sort of... You can't say one material is good and one material is bad, right? There's so much variation depending on, I don't know, a, a range of factors, so sort of where you are, where you are in the world, or what variety of a certain type of material you're using, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, th there's things. So, if, you know, it's almost if you know we're doing something with recycled aluminium at the moment, you have to then forego the idea of anodizing and accept that it's going to be painted. Um, you have to also accept that it's ten percent more expensive than raw aluminium so there's you know and therefore the product is more expensive but um yeah it's all it's somehow it's it's knowledge and information that needs to be uh made more prevalent and then in which case i guess what what when you're sort of thinking about sustainable approach what are the sort of what are the key drivers what are the things i guess what are the specific kind of sustainability factors that you're sort of making your priority is it sort of is it the sort of uh, the recyclability? Is it sort of natural materials? Like, is there a kind of particular thing that you sort of, I guess, really sort of drives what what you're trying to do? I think fundamentally, it's it's the kind of um, it's the right to repair. It's that something can be maintained, that it can match the lifespan of its environment, and recyclability is almost um, that's still it's still key, but it's got to be the, the the full life cycle of the product, you know. And I think you know something coming back to sort of like, you know, soft cells, it's something that's been on our office ceiling for, you know, since, since the practice was, was built, and it's something that, um, it is maintainable, and, and that's where, you know, the, the, the problem with interiors and, 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 and fit out, so often, new tenants come in, they'll tear out carpets, they go to landfill, furniture is, you know, maybe designed only to last a few years, so again, you know, if it's not repairable, it's not replaceable, and it's not recyclable, because it's a mix of materials, it's all going to landfill. So I think um, these are all challenges that um, you know, we all face. Mm. And so and you talked in your presentation a little bit about kind of trying to create things that outlive, outlive you and sort of taking that very sort of Scandinavian approach, which is built to last, but also taking it that one step further. Um, I mean, you know, this talk is sort of longevity is a sort of key theme here. Tell me a little bit about, I guess, how you go about doing that. How do you make something and feel confident that people will sort of value it or, you know, w that it will last? I think for, for me, it's all about prioritization. So how do you prioritize if you're doing, for example, interior design? Um, and, and for me, I will always start with, and we're Danes, and that's why we love our wooden floors. So it often starts with Dinesen, which is our uh, legacy company in Denmark. Um, uh, by the way, very sustainable. Um, they so so it's something we will prioritize doing, and then we start building up from there. But we're also minimalist, so um, in in all the interior work that we do, we'd much rather have fewer things that are much better built, that are built within our control and uh, our supervision, um, than filling uh, our homes up with things that we don't need. Um, so it's all about, for me, prioritizing. Uh, uh, obtaining the knowledge about which manufacturers um, um, you want to work with and that um, that has a sustainable focus. I guess it's it's a battle, I guess, against that kind of consumer culture and sort of changing the mindset amongst people that are buying products to think about, you know, valuing things that last or sort of valuing less. Like, is there a, I mean, it's, it's a difficult challenge, I suppose. Is there a sort of... A, like how do how do we how do we as designers go about doing that? I think I think it is difficult because a lot of the products that has uh, really been thought through, like uh, we just talked about before, they do become quite expensive. 
um, but I also think that that has a merit, understanding that it, it comes with a price, that you are paying for something to be more sustainable, to be better built, to be uh, uh, well designed and engineered so you can replace components. I think that's something that we really are looking into in our sort of like data uh, phase before we start designing anything that it is possible uh, to do. So I think uh, it, it, it needs to be um, thought through in a full circle um, so things can, can, can you know, um, go into a uh, full recyclable um, thought. And sort of applying that same mentality to sort of at the larger scale, Francesca, sort of, you know, you were talking about some projects um, about sort of, you know, reuse of old buildings and we are still at a point where renovation isn't really as sexy as, uh, as new architecture, but do you think that's sort of something that's changing and do you think that we can kind of start to find, you know, start to encourage people to, to get excited about a renovated old building or, you know, when you find a place and uncover that incredible ceiling that's for some reason been sort of hidden away and boarded up for, 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 for decades. Well, you're talking to an Italian that uh, when I came to US, I was a little bit shocked about how easy they would tear down interior building that for me, they were totally beautiful. Like from the beginning of the century, uh, one, one, one day in looking from my building, I was like looking at this, uh, like a neo-Gothic uh, uh, beginning of the century and they say, okay, they are renovating the, the, the roof, but no, they were tearing down floor by floor. And it was so sad and disappointing for me, something that for me was like the memory of New York, it was downtown. And uh, I think that finally, I mean, I wouldn't say, uh, even in, in New York and US, they're starting a little bit like um, with the mentality of uh, enhancing what they have. Uh, I mean, it's not as in, in Italian, European way, of course, that they might even be sometimes too conservative, but they, they are starting in using what is there and then really changing the use. And, then, and I think it is up to us, uh, a designer or architect, uh, to really make uh, uh, the client uh, um, um, sensible uh, to what they have, uh, what is there, and tr trans transmit them the, the beauty of these, uh, of the old buildings. Um, so it's coming, it's, it's coming, and it is up to us and our creativity, I think, to really uh, transmit uh, how uh, old buildings can have, like, of course, like a new life, new, different interpretation, and sometimes it's even better than a new construction. So. We're, we're getting a little bit low on time, so I think probably now would be a good time to see if we have any questions from the audience. Don't be shy. Does anyone have any question for our panelists about sustainability and longevity in design? We've got one down here at the front. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name's Sol Campbell. Um, when I look at you guys, I think everybody wants sustainability. I think it's fantastic, and then it is the way to go. But what kind of really screams out is cost. How do you actually get it to the mass market? Because that's what it's all about, really. Because I see big budgets. Uh, big fees, but yes, it's fantastic doing this, but if you want to drop it down to the mass market, how are you going to do that? Do you need government support to kind of help with the prices, things like that, but we need some help because it, we need to push it into the mass market. I can start with giving one example, which was the client tiny house that we we're doing together because we were talking and chatting about this before we went on stage. Um, I don't have an answer, <laughs> I want to just be upfront, but I can uh, at least tell you what our challenges is. Because we, we started Klein in order to make democratic tiny housing. That was, that's the goal, right? Designed by the world's best architects. Be smart, figure out how to manufacture it. But um, the manufacturing industry, let's call it the prefab industry in this case, um, they are way too busy, they are way too focused on making money and not interested in uh, what we have to offer. So basically they're already selling to the consumer and we're asking to buy as a business from them. So in my first slide, and this is several years ago when I had my first board meeting with, uh, with Bjarke and the team from BIC, it was actually, will Klein needs to have its own manufacturing capabilities? Will we have to manufacture ourselves in order to achieve this? And that is still several years later, something that we're debating at 
basically every board meeting at Klein, will we have to do this ourselves in order to build it correctly? Because it's, it is in this case, and I'm not saying because we just saw a lot of uh, great examples of where it is uh, obtained. I know it's, it's obtained in, in life straw because that's, I'm, I'm very close to someone who, who actually values that and they cannot do expensive manufacturing, by the way. A life straw costs one dollar. So, uh, um, and every time you buy one, they actually give and provide uh, a child with clean drinking water for a year. Um, in Africa. So, but I think it's a very valid question. I think it's something that we're working with and uh, I don't think necessarily that, that the goal is for us to take over manufacturing of these tiny houses, but that is the thought process that we're going through um, as at least as a provocation. Would we have to do it ourselves in order to be sustainable? Either of you two uh, want to respond at all? Hello? Ah, yes, okay. So maybe I also don't have the solution, of course, but uh, what I can say is that we try to uh, decide the, the fight that we want to uh, pursue for each case in each building and which is the scale that we want to, 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 to work on. So there are comp compromises that we do all, all the time, of course, but maybe sometimes it is identify the material that we are using the most in the building and that find that as a, like the most sustainable one and then maybe compromise on other to still be in the budget that the client has. And sometimes it's a lot of education to the client, it's like a lot of presentation explaining uh, what is good in using like the specific wood or like uh, another material in relation to others that are more like uh, with a shorter lifespan. So it is uh, a, a critical approach uh, case by case. Um, I think they can exist um, together. I think the chair that was showing at the start, we actually, we started with a price point from, from, the, from the first point. So we were aiming low cost, low carbon, and that meant reducing waste and reducing, you know, reducing the waste of timber is, you know, it, you're serving both. So the tool paths, the machining, the energy involved, they, 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 they accrue a level of carbon, they accrue uh, a cost. So th they can exist. It's more challenging, but in, but in, but in many cases they can coexist. Do we have an, I think we have another question from the audience down here. <laughs> this gentleman in the white, white shirt. Thank, thank you very much for the, for the insights. It was very interesting. My, my name is Francesco Cara, and I teach at YED uh, Milan uh, Sustainable Design. Um, I would like to understand how you approach uh, the supply chain and the complexities that come with long and uh, distributed supply chains and making sure that those supply chains are really supporting you in your sustainability work, whether you have any tricks, whether you work with fewer suppliers, whether you work with shorter supply chains. So if you could elaborate on that, it would be very useful. Thank you. Ooh, good question. Um, I think, um, I think um, your question is correct because it's not the product, it's, it's the business model that's behind it. That's what can make a product um, more efficient. And I think we've been working with companies that have complex supply chains, sourcing materials from um, certain places, and we've been helping them to refine that, bring it down to something that's more local, um, swapping out certain materials, let's say, you know, um, within desking, looking at different surfaces, looking at, you know, linoleum instead of um, um, laminates. There are, so, so I think you do, you, you, you have to simplify supply chains and you have to consider that as the, as the product, the kind of 360 degree view of a product. Um, but it does, that, that, that's the heart, your question is at the heart of, of, of the issue. It's an, it's an interesting question though, isn't it? Because I think traceability is something that people are increasingly looking at and there are uh, separate companies now that sort of offer traceability as a service, right? Sort of really delving into supply chains and kind of being able because it's, it's, there's, there's, some of them are really hard to get to the bottom of, right? So it's sort of, I guess the information is coming and hopefully will continue to come and we'll be able to know a little bit more. Yeah, I think it's easier for, you know, people like Mattiazzi and Benchmark, they're dealing in mono materials, they're dealing in, in a singular supply chain. 
electronic manufacturers, it's far more difficult. Um, it's still achievable, but you've got to go back through, you know, through the chain. Um, so it's challenging, but possible. But I think also that um, it also means that products need to evolve and change. You know, if we take the whole, the right to repair components, you know, why can't uh, within, you know, electronic products that we have at home, why can't the wearable parts be modules that can be replaced so that we're extending the lifespan? Um, so again, it's all, it's intermixed with the business model, it's intermixed with the product design uh, and, you know, the eventual consumer. Wonderful. I think we have time for one more if we have any more questions from the floor. Oh, there's a lady here in the blue. One of the things that Mike mentioned was designing for, my name's Pam Daniels from Chicago. Um, one of the things you mentioned was designing an appropriate lifespan to match the setting. And I'm wondering if you can say more about that because one of the time-honored things from industrial design was long-lasting. But what if it's not long-lasting? What if it should just dissolve over time? What if it should disappear? And I'm wondering if you can talk about how this desire to maybe make things last an appropriate amount of time instead of a long time is impacting some of your thinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, our design, <laughs> that's a tricky question because you don't want your creation dissolve somehow, right? <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> but definitely when we design a product also, I mean, um, we, we need to accept the fact that uh, uh, there is a life to to objects, and then uh, we we work with the manufacturer to uh, to understand what uh, what how what is what can be the next product that uh, is uh, can use the p a portion of the part of the material of the previous one. Um, I think one example that we're actually working with right now is just like a traditional straw. Everybody uh, know that a lot of plastic straws uh, have been used around the globe. We're literally like talking billions of plastic straws and most countries are banning plastic straws right now. So you can't use them, which is a great thing. But I think most people <laughs> have tried now using a paper straw, which is what you get if you buy a Coke or a milkshake and um, it doesn't work. So we have actually had a study where we looked at materials that would somehow be something that you could literally compost uh, but still use. But it's a, it's a very complicated um, uh, process and there's a reason why it still haven't been you know, thought. But it's just to say that just a simple thing as we probably all use uh, several times a year, uh, a straw is currently needs a designer and an engineer to figure out what is the future of just a traditional straw and, and to your point something that will not last a long time and will not make any impact at all. I think just as an end note it'd be really nice to hear from you all I guess um, we're room through a lot of a lot of people in the industry or in design and we've got a lot of people watching at home. Um, I guess sort of as a message to sort of designers trying to kind of make better choices, be more sustainable, design more for longevity, what advice would you give them? And maybe that's to all of you. <laughs> Ask a lot of questions. I think that's what we all do. That's why we, you know, in the process of, of obtaining data in order to design anything, we ask a lot of questions. We can ask if, a, if aluminum is recycled, for example, with Gandia Blasco that we do our outdoor collection with, and they can say that it is, but that's probably as deep as, at least in our studio, that we are able to go in our research uh, for that. But, but just ask questions about manufacturing process, about if they're carbon neutral, about how they, you know, their machines, how their factory work, what they outsource, um, and, and ask about having, you know, say that you have an opinion about which, you know, how your packaging or, you know, for, for your product is going to be because it is important. It is what the consumer will uh, think of you. We have, we have people writing the studio and saying that they don't like the packaging of products that we're out of our control and saying, we know, <laughs> we agree with you. We would like to make a more sustainable packaging mm -hmm. for that product as well. But it's, in the end, it's for us a negotiation with the manufacturer. So just ask questions. Yes, exactly. And be curious and deep dive into the process of things and since the very beginning. Yeah, I think it's um, diving in to the full 360 sort of degree 
um, life of a product, looking at where the materials are going to come from, look at the, the product, how it's going to be maintained, um, how parts can be replaced, the packaging, the transportation, uh, and looking at the whole, the whole life cycle, not just the product. Fantastic. Well, I think you've given us a lot of food for thought. Um, I just want to say thank you to all three of you for your contributions. Apologies, everyone, for a little bit of technical issues, but thanks so much for bearing with us um, and for joining us today. Thanks so much to Gaganel um, for, for hosting. We've got three more, uh, two more talks, uh, 10 o'clock every morning. Um, so those watching at home, please tune in again. Um, thanks to Villanecki for hosting us, and thanks so much. See you next time. <laughs>